so let's spend some time talking about this idea of a confidence a confidence interval anytime we're using the word interval we're talking about right some range of values from some lower bound to some upper bound some range of values um, in this case talking about a confidence interval, we're trying to um, develop an interval in which we have some level of confidence that our estimate from our sample, um, that our estimate will give us, um, our sample will give us a good estimate of the population value. So what we're trying to do is take a sample and use it to estimate the population value. So in this case, what you're seeing is a population and a sample mean. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be strictly means. We could also have a sample proportion and use that sample proportion to make an estimate about the population proportion. So we could have a sample a sample proportion and a population proportion. So the basic idea with both of these is um, to take a smaller group and use it to make a statement about a larger group, a smaller group in our sample to make a larger, uh, to make a statement about the larger population as a whole. Now what's an example of this? Um, it may not be possible, for example, to get to every single voter in the United States if we want to see um, who which candidate the country is likely to vote for. We may grab, say, 1,300 people. That's our sample. And then in those 1,300, we may find that um, 900 out of 1,300, that's our sample proportion, are going to vote for a particular candidate. And so, um, whatever um, we get from this sample proportion, we want to be able to say then that the population value um, can be derived or inferred from our sample. So typically what we'll do is find a pop, uh, the sample proportion and then with that sample proportion um, we will add plus or minus a value um, and that value that error is based on the size of the sample um, and there are statistical methods and there's math to support the error so we'll come up with proportion, but then we'll say plus or minus um, some margin of error e. So estimating a population value, we don't truly estimate just simply the value. What we do is we say that it sits or resides within some interval. So in this case, the sample proportion was a 0.6923. Um, so what we'll do is um, figure out the margin of error and we'll say that the margin of error, if I made up a value 0.6923, um, I'll, I'll save that for the actual, I'll say that the population value is um, maybe 0.69 minus 
so that would take 0 0.01 which would take me down to 0 0.68 2, 3 um, up to 0 0.7023 um, where in this case we're using a margin of error of 0 0.01 um, so where so the easy part is getting the sent the population I mean the sample proportion the part that needs some discussion is this margin of error component if we want 95 percent confidence or 90 percent confidence or 99 percent confidence this error component is going to change and what we're going to see is that as we go for more higher confidence in our in our sample um, where we're trying to estimate the population then if we want higher confidence we're going to have to allow for greater error we'll see that in the math so that's um, the introduction to proportions and similarly for um, confidence intervals for means um, we may want to know for example what is the oh what is the population um, IQ we don't know what the population IQ is so we can take a sample small n and let's say that we have uh, we find 200 people and in those 200 people we find that their IQ is 102 um, and so for our sample they have an IQ of 102 but um, we're doing inferencing right? we're trying to find confidence intervals so we're trying to make inferences, or this is a type of inferencing. So we could confer, I'm sorry, we could infer that the um, population mean is pretty close to our sample. It's 102. Um, plus or minus some margin of error. So we won't write it like this, what we're going to do is let's say that the margin of error is um, is this three. Um, what we will say then is that with some level of confidence, we know that the population value can be expected to be found in the mean plus or minus some margin of error and if that margin of error happens to be three um, then this would um, give us one uh, 99 up to 105 so we will be able to say with some confidence that the mean is can be expected to be found within this interval so that's the basic idea of confidence intervals. You're taking a sample mean or sample proportion and then making a statement about the population mean or the population proportion. So there are some conditions um, that are going to have to be honored in order for us to accurately or reliably, reliably estimate the population mean and to ri uh, reliably estimate um, the population proportion. Um, again for each one of these we're going to go to a sample and then try to make a statement. We're going to figure out a margin of error and that margin of error 
and the way we do it depends on a number of factors but certainly it depends on whether or not we're looking at a mean or a proportion so if we want to estimate mu there are a couple of things that, uh, that should be honored we want to make sure that it's a simple random sample meaning it's a subgroup of the population that reflects um, uh, the population in its diversity um, so a, a simple random sample is not just sampling one individual it's sampling a group of individuals and if you were to go back and randomly select whatever it is 10 more then those 10 should be just as likely as the first 10 um, so a simple random sample is when you select a group not selecting one but you're selecting some n values from a larger population um, that's one of the things that needs to um, to hold in order for us to get a reliable accurate a reliable estimate of mu and we need an SRS also for um, estimating the proportion uh, the population proportion another um, thing we're going to assume for the moment is that we know what the standard deviation is for the population um, and then the third thing is um, at least one of the following things is true at least one of the following is true um, so we should have a normally distributed DIST normally distributed population um, or at least our sample has to be um, greater than 30 now there are some other things to consider um, if it's not greater than 30 or if sigma is not known um, there may be um, correction factors to deal with etc etc but let's just get some exercise in the mechanics um, and then let's also finish this some of the um, conditions where we can uh, that satisfy they must be satisfied in, in order for us to estimate the proportion population so SRS then the conditions for a binomial distribution are satisfied so what um, are those conditions for a binomial distribution? Let's take a look at that. So the conditions for binomial distribution um, were these conditions here. A fixed number of trials, um, only two possible outcomes, a success or failure, yes, no, uh, make or miss um, the probability of success is the same for each trial and then the random variable um, we have random barrel the, this particular random variable indicates the number of successful trials and so we would remember that um, right from our from our use of binomial PDF
So the conditions for binomial distribution are satisfied. Um, I'll leave that there. And finally, um, we want at least five successes. and five failures, All right? So we want enough data um, so that we can approximate our binomial distribution as a normal distribution. Um, and so what we saw before is that um, if the number of um, if the number of trials is too small, then what we could normally take as a discrete distribution that looked reasonably normal. If, um, if the number of trials was too small, or if the probability of a success was too small, or the probability of a failure was too small, right? We had some conditions regarding NP and NQ. Um, so if we had some of those conditions, then it, it um, the curve did not look, or the discrete distribution didn't quite look so normal. So those conditions that I'm showing here help us meet those conditions of normality. So each time we get a sample, um, what we have learned from the central th uh, limit theorem is that each sample, right, each sample, the first one, the second one, or the ith one, um, is a reasonably good estimate. So it's, it is a point estimate. of mu. Um, so each sample is a point estimate of mu. For example, if you recall that if you were given a normal distribution which had a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, right? This is what it looked like for the population of IQs. Something like that. Um, centered around the mean and a standard deviation. And I could ask you a question such as what's the probability of randomly selecting a name out of a hat? Um, where that IQ is maybe, say, less than 95. And that question here is um, essentially the same question as saying, what percentage of the distribution, right, what percentage of the distribution is less than, than, is less than 95? And what, popu uh, and what percentage of the population has an IQ less than 95, that's what this answers. So let's go ahead and mark that in. Uh, bring this in a little bit. So we're looking at 95, and this answers the question of what's the probability of randomly selecting someone whose IQ is less than 95. Given that the distribution looks like this, right, if we know that it's normal, and we have the mean and we have the standard deviation, that's enough for us to determine what the area is under that curve. Once we have those three parameters, it really fixes the function that defines that curve, and so we can use our calculator.
to figure out what that probability is. Now the area underneath here goes from, well, negative infinity. Um, and so we'll just say negative 999. Um, and in fact, since not much happens on the other side of three standard deviations, three standard deviations is 45. So if I were to just simply say 100 minus 45, I know that that fixes me to about that point, 100 plus um, 45 or three standard deviations. That's where 99.7% of the area resides within three standard deviations. So I could have just as easily have said negative uh, 100 minus 45, which takes me to 55. Um, and, and that's going to give me um, essentially the same value. If I just use negative 999, it's easier to not have to do that work and plug in negative infinity. So now that we have that, that's the left bound. The right bound on this goes up to um, 95. And then to actually fix a particular curve or to set it at a particular um, bell curve, we go ahead and drop in the mu and the standard deviation. And then we can use our calculator to get an answer for that. So if we use a normal cumulative distribution function to calculate the area that started at negative infinity all the way up to um, 95 for a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. We take a look at that and we have a 0.369. Um, 0 0.369, so about 37, there's a 37% chance that you would randomly select someone and have an I find someone with an IQ less than 95. Now, if we were to try to use 55 instead of negative 999, um, plug that into a calculator, you'll see that it's 0.368. Um, so the difference is over in a thousandths. Instead of 36.9%, we're talking 36.8%. So the difference is really small. Um, so again, this is intended to help us start thinking about the um, we're trying to get to the point where we're thinking about intervals and estimates, right? We're trying to do inferencing. And inferencing um, is based on the idea of getting a sample, not just selecting one individual, but selecting a sample. And if you select a sample of individuals, Um, that that sample of individuals, let's say that we select, um, oh, let's use 81. So if we select 81 individuals, and if we determine that that particular group has an average IQ, um, of 95. Um, that group has a particular distribution that's different from the previous normal distribution. Um, every time I take a sample and another sample and another sample, like every time I take a sample and put that value into a histogram, um, x1 is 95. If I take another sample where I may have some individuals of 80 and some individuals um, of 120, um, 
I'll still end up with values that are close to the actual population mean of 100. There's not going to be as much variation in the samples because the lows and the highs embedded within any sample cancel each other out. So each one of those, when you put them into a histogram, will give us a normal distribution, but it's a normal distribution with less variation. So that might be one sample, another sample, a third sample. Um, and all of these are going to um, center around the original population mean. So this particular curve is still normal. It has a particular mean um, and it has a particular standard deviation. And the central limit theorem says that the mean of that curve for all of those various, various, those many, many samples um, that would be used to build it would be equal to the population mean and the standard deviation would be um, equal to the regular um, population standard deviation and divided by the square root of n. Um, so notice that if we keep sampling, those samples um, will tend to spread around the mean, um, right? So 68% per 68 of them are going to be plus or minus one standard deviation. 95% are going to be plus or minus two standard deviations. Um, you got to remember that our population, big N, might be um, 10 million. And so as our samples get larger, um, we get closer and closer to, uh, to predicting or yielding and producing the actual population mean. So as our sample gets really, really large, this right here, this um, standard deviation spread gets smaller, right? Because as n on the bottom gets larger, the spread gets smaller. And in fact, if n went to infinity, if it went to the largest number of values, um, this error, this uh, standard deviation, would be zero because we would actually target and hit the true population value. So the larger the n is, the less the spread is. So this acts as really, it's, um, we call it, it's a standard deviation of sorts, but a common term for it also is the standard error. of the mean. So that's another term for for this. But since we're working with a different distribution here, and if I take a sample of a class and I get um, um, I go ahead and get an average of 95. I may want to know what's the probability of being that far from 100, right? What's the probability that we could get a sample that far from 100? So we'll say to the left of 95, or that far um, that much lower than the population value. Um, so this area over here is going to be much smaller than what we saw with the population. Um, right? We're looking at the sample distribution here and not the population distribution. So this is the distribution or the histogram of all of the various samples
imaginable and that's different than a population distribution um, and so when I plug that into my calculator it's the central limit theorem says under certain conditions let's just go through the mechanics for now it's still going to be negative infinity and we're going to take it up to 95 like we did before and then what is the mean and distribution for a sample wait what is that I'm sorry what is the mean and the standard deviation for a sample distribution um, it's going to be the same as the population mean 100 and then um, the standard deviation is really the same as um, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n so that's going to be um, 15 divided by the square root of 81 so 15 divided by 9 so 15 over 9 um, is going to be what 1 and 6 ninths or 1 and 2 thirds 1 point say 1 point call it 1.6 or 1.7 1.7 as a standard deviation is much smaller than 15 um, that's one thing to note so now what I want to do is use this let's go ahead and plug this in and see what we get out of this normal CDF and instead of 15 it's going to be 15 divided by uh, the square root of 81 Zero zero one three five. So it's highly unlikely. Um, that's almost it's not zero probability, but the percentage is less than a you know two tenths. It's it's point one percent. So 0 0.00135 um, as compared to 0.369. So there's a huge difference. Um, so we can do some pretty useful things with this. Um, so the one important thing that that's worth thinking about is if you're given a population and you're told that um, that kind of this is the given this is the truth and you want to test the veracity or the truth of this and if you come up with a population that um, such as we came up with um, of 95 the probability of your getting that 95 is so small that it begs the question what went wrong either the original value is an error right maybe that's not quite correct or maybe there's something wrong with our sample um, so this is the way that we can um, set up a hypothesis test where we're given some initial value and then we go get a sample and then we determine what the probability is of, of hitting um, or meeting or, or getting that that probability or probability um, such as what we did achieve for that sample this probability when we think about the fact that we're trying to test whether or not this is um, 
we have enough evidence to support the fact that the IQ is um, is 100. This p value is considered um, this value right here is considered the p value of um, of that test statistic. Um, so we'll say more about hypothesis tests a little bit later. But it's really a hypothesis test involves given some known value and then getting a sample and then determining what's the probability of either being that far um, beneath the um, the given probability or the given um, population value or maybe believe that it's greater than what's the probability of being um, a certain distance to the right of it. Um, so that's kind of a sketch of the, the layout of a hypothesis test, but more on that later. Okay, so what got us started about this, with this, on this path, is that we were trying to um, make estimates for the population mean and, and or um, a population proportion from a sample. There are some conditions that um, we'll have to assume are met, or we'll have to check, rather, that they're met. And let's just look at um, one other thing. When we get our sample, well, first, let's, I think we can do a simple example of, of applying this um, and then I'll justify this. So if I want to um, show you the mechanics, the mechanics on this, I want, for example, um, a 95% confidence interval for the population mean then I can use this right here it's going to be x bar so I use the sample mean, and then just plus or minus 1.96 times um, the standard error. So x bar plus or, mi plus or minus um, 1.96 times um, sigma over the square root of n. Um, so sometimes to abbreviate this, um, I'll just say x bar, whatever that sample is, plus or minus some margin of error. But this is the general formula. So let's maybe do a simple calculation with this. Let's say we want to estimate um, the speed of, of, uh, of drivers who get ticketed. And it's for the population of drivers who get ticketed. And for whatever reason, in this particular county, let's say I don't have access and I don't, for a number of reasons, I don't have access to all of those drivers. Um, 
and I need to use a sample. So for this example, we're going to estimate the average speed of drivers in the population. that are ticketed and let's say that the zone was a 55 mile per hour zone so what we want to know is what is the average speed for all of the drivers and they get ticketed and that, that could be you know, maybe it's 35,000, um, but it's it's a number that's usually quite a bit bigger than the sample. And the, so for our sample, um, we were able to pull the records for 90 individuals, and the average speed for those was 66.2 miles per hour. And let's say that for the population, we know that it's known, so it's a given. So sigma is known to be 3.4 miles per hour. So we're going to estimate the population value and we're going to do it um, at a 95% confidence interval. And so to get that value I'm going to use the 66.2 plus or minus some margin of error. So that's kind of the short of it. It's actually just plugging in a few numbers. We're saying that we have 95% um, confidence that the mean um, of the population value mu is going to be found in this interval. There's, a, there's a, a stronger statement that we'll make and it'll become more theoretical. Um, but we have some confidence, 95% confidence, that our mean is going to be within um, this interval of values. So let's calculate that interval of values. It's 66.2 plus or minus 1.96 and then the standard error, 3.4 over the square root of 90. And um, let's calculate what that is. So what is that margin of error? Um, it's going to be 1.96 times 3.4 divided by the square root of 90 and we get 0.702 so the margin of error is 0 0.70245. So 66.2 plus or minus um, 0 0.702. Um, and I'll keep it to four decimal places. So that would take us um, 0 0.7024. 447, 447.
So when I take it to 1, 2, 3, 4, and look at the guy to the right, it's less than 5, so I'll use the point 7024. And so that's 66.2 minus 0 0.7024 and 66.2 plus 0 0.7024 and so that is 65.498 and on the other side let's recall that second entry and let's change that to uh, from a minus to a plus um, what did I type in incorrectly 66.2 from a minus to a plus I see let's try that 66.9 So let's take it down to one decimal place. Well, the last thing you want to do is simplify. You want to do that at the end. You don't want to start rounding off too early. So 65.5 to 66.9. So in a 55 mile per hour zone, we have um, reasonably high confidence that those who get ticketed are uh, driving in this range, this interval of values. So it, you would think that um, that you have to drive at least at least 10 miles above the speed limit um, before you get ticketed. So somewhere between um, 65.5 and 66.9 is the average. So this suggests that those who are driving 60 are far less likely to get ticketed. Um, so this is how we do a, an interval, um, a confidence interval for the population mean. We took a sample and then kind of tweaked it plus or minus some margin of error. Um, what we haven't talked about is where this function comes from. Um, so that's going to be the, the next video and that takes a little bit longer but um, using the ideas are pretty straightforward. One last thing um, is that your calculator can do some of this work for you. If I go over here and I do a um, it's an interval, and I want to do a Z interval. And I have the standard deviation of 3.4, the mean to be 66.2, the sample size to be 90, confidence level to be 0.95 um, and so the 65.5 and the 66.902 match the values that we got when we did it manually. So Z interval um, is another way of getting those same values. So it seems like you get a lot for just a little bit of math. Um, we can estimate population means from sample values. The thinking that goes behind that um, is what I'll say for the next, but I'll try to do one more example of estimating a population mean. So for this one, let's say we had a sample of 45 test tubes that were tested.
um, to determine how many times oops, 49 sample of 49 test tubes were tested to determine how many times they could be heated um, on a burner before they crack so we have a sample and on this given the sample we want to make a statement about the population of test tubes um, so for this sample um, we discovered that if we heat a test tube up and, and wait it for it to crack, that also a test tube can be reheated, say, on average, um, 1,230 times before it cracks. And the standard deviation, we're going to take the given Um, so it takes about a thousand times of using a test tube before before it cracks. So for this problem, you're being asked to construct a 99%. Oops, let's make it a 95% confidence interval. for mu. So um, the short answer is that um, mu, the population value we're trying to get to, is just simply x bar plus or minus some margin of error. So that's 1,230 plus or minus the margin of error. And that margin of error, um, the margin of error that's connected to the 95%, um, E is 1.96 sigma over the square root of n. What we'll see later is that if I change the confidence interval, then the margin of error has to change. Um, the how and why we will talk about, but you can, if if you want much higher confidence from that simple sample, you got to imagine that the margin of error then is going to open up, and this is actually going to be a larger value. I'll show you why a bit a bit later. So the margin of error then is going to be 1.96 times 270 divided by the square root of 49 um, and if I we know that the square root of 49 is a 7 so 270 over 7 so let's drop that in um, Let's clear this. And it's going to be 1.96 times 270 over 7. So 75.6. So what we're looking at is. 1230 plus or minus the 75.6 so if I subtract 75.6 so it's plus or minus so usually you do the lower end for the interval first so do the subtraction first and then show the addition next So doing the math, we'll see that 1230 minus 75.6 is 1154.4. And on the upper end, let's bring that in again. Um, second entry, well, second, 
second entry. Well, let me just do the. So it's going to be 12:30 plus 75.6. 1305. So that is the confidence interval that we have for the population value. So even though our sample was 1230, um, we estimate mu um, at 95% confidence to be in that interval. Um, we'll do it one last way. Let's go ahead and plug these values into our calculator and let it do some of that work that we just did. Um, clear. And we'll do just simply statistics. And this is a Z interval, number seven. The standard deviation was 270. The mean was 1230. And then the number um, in our sample was 49. Confidence level 0 0.95. 1154 to 1305.6. and 11.54 and 13.05. So it gives us the same value. So those are the mechanics. Um, in the next segment, we're going to look at justifying um, this formula here. And then also what happens if we want 98%, 99%, or 90% confidence intervals? How does that change? Well, it just changes this one particular value. So we'll dig into that a bit later.